This is the U.S. News. Former Vice President and U.S. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden released his tax records to the public Tuesday, just hours before meeting President Donald Trump on stage in Cleveland, Ohio, for their first of three debates before the November 3rd election day. Biden's timing highlighted a New York Times story published Sunday about tax information that President Trump has shielded from the public for years. The story showed that Trump had paid just $750 in federal income taxes the year he won the presidency, and the same for his first year in office. While Trump professes to be a billionaire, that sum is less than many middle-class households pay. By contrast, Biden's returns show that he and his wife Jill paid a hefty $299,346 in federal income taxes for 2019. That was the last year for which we have that data. While Biden is expected to focus on the Trump taxes, Mr. Trump is expected to lean on his narrative that Biden is senile and needs some help getting through the debate. He has repeatedly demanded that Biden take a drug test before or after the debate. On Tuesday, the Trump campaign demanded that Biden also be checked for a secret earpiece, presumably to give him answers during the debate. A Biden campaign manager called that idea absurd. North Korea gave no indication on Tuesday that it's moved any closer to denuclearization in its statement during the final day of the UN General Assembly. North Korea's U.N. Ambassador Kim Song said peace can be safeguarded only when one possesses the strength to prevent war. To that end, the ambassador said, quote, peace and serenity of the Korean Peninsula and the region are now firmly defended. The administration of President Trump has demanded complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization from the rogue nation. But the two summits between the two leaders have brought no progress so far. BOA News. Armenia and Azerbaijan traded accusations on Tuesday of firing on each other across a shared border. It was the latest sign of a conflict over the breakaway region of Nagorno-Karabakh that is threatening to erupt into war. Both countries reported firing to the west of the region, where intense fighting broke out Sunday between ethnic Armenian and, and Azeri forces, killing dozens of people and wounding hundreds of others. Speaking on Russian state television, Azerbaijan President Yelam Aliyev and Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan both rejected the possibility of talks, despite urgent appeals from Russia and the United States to end the violence. The United Nations Security Council was expected to discuss the escalating fighting in the region on Tuesday. A spokesman for UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres spoke to both Aliyev and uh, Pashinyan and called for a mean, an immediate stop to the fighting a de-escalation of tension, and a return to meaningful negotiations without preconditions or delay. Britain and Canada have imposed sanctions on Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, his son and other top officials, for allegedly rigging the country's presidential election and committing acts of violence against protesters. The sanctions are the first imposed by major Western powers against Belarusian government officials. The sanctions subject them to an immediate travel ban and asset freeze. Lukashenko's post-election crackdown has resulted in the arrest of more than 12,000 people who participated in mass demonstrations that erupted after he claimed victory in an election that opponents allege was stolen. Lukashenko has denied that the election was fixed. The lifting of crippling economic sanctions against Mali by a bloc of 15 West African countries will come later than first thought, even after the appointment of Mali's new transitional civilian prime minister, Mokhtar Wan. ECOWAS imposed sanctions on Mali shortly after last month's coup that ousted President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. The group said they would lift sanctions after civilian leaders were appointed during the transition period. But the French news press reports a sticking point with West African leaders may be junta leader Colonel Asimi Goita's appointment. As the transitional vice president, Goita was among the junta leaders involved in the coup. ECOWAS envoy and Nigerian ex-president Goodluck Jonathan said in a statement that the military leaders have yet to satisfy ECOWAS's demand that a civilian be named as vice president. West African leaders are expected to make a decision on their next step after Jonathan submits a formal report to the leader of ECOWAS, which will be reviewed by member countries. Via remote, I'm Marissa Melton from Washington. You're listening to BOA News.